Right. First, I apologize. I do not speak any word of Japanese. So this will be difficult for you and for me. Now this person, I think you know. Yes? You know who this is? This is a 16-year-old Swedish girl who in one year has become very famous because she started big protests for climate and climate change. And here she is very angry because she was talking in the United Nations and people didn't like what she was saying and did not want to do anything. What I am going to talk about is that what we think is climate change only is actually a problem caused by people. And I am going to try to show you how that happened. To do that, I will take the last part of the evolution that the professor just talked about. I will only talk about humans when they began to change the environment. Do you know this? Do you know where this is? This is in Kyoto. And this is not so long ago, when many people on the street protest because government does not do things to stop climate change. This photo is new. It was this morning. And the top shows a glacier in Iceland in 1989. And the lower photo, the photo at the bottom, shows the same place in 2019, a few weeks ago. The whole glacier has disappeared and all that is left is water. This shows how things have changed in the last 250 years. On the left, you see how nature has changed. On the right, you see how humans have caused change in society, like how many hamburgers are sold every year, how much oil is being used, and things like that. The images look very much like the same. And that is to show that this is not only an environment problem, but it is also a society problem. Now we get to something that I think you will understand, but that is difficult for me to explain. It is that through all of human history, what has changed most is information. Now you have cell phones. You can access the web. You can access all the information that there is available. Where we began as human beings, we could not do that. We only could talk to our family because the group was only the family. So I'm going to speak about some of this. Basically, 
what I will distinguish is a period until about 70,000 years before the present in which the brain was not big enough and not good enough to do the things that we can do now. From that period, when I have this number two, three, and four, we see how population grows and how more and more information can be processed in our brains. And after me, Denis will be talking about human brains. And he will tell you in detail how that works. Here, I am making it very simple. This graph shows the relationship between the size of the brain and the size of the body. And what you can see from right to left is how more and more the brain grows faster than the body. So the brain becomes bigger than it was before. And that is the biological trend that makes it possible for humans to process more and more information. This is some of the result. At the top left, that is the earliest kind of tools people make. It is stone and it is 1,300,000 years old. At the bottom right, you see a stone that was made also by people, but about 100,000 years ago. So you can see how people get much better at making stone tools. That is part of the capacity of the brain as it grows. This is how people were living for at least two million years. They were living in small groups like families. They were only talking to each other and very rarely to somebody else. And so together they could find a way to live which sort of worked. There were many times that they suffered, that they were, had wounded or didn't have enough to eat, but enough of them survived for humans to actually survive that whole two million years. And they did that in a very simple way. They walk in the landscape and all they do is they eat the animals that they can kill and the fruits and parts of plants that they can find and some fishes also. But very simple. Not like now with big rooms, lights, technology, electronics and everything else. Then about 3,500, a thousand years before the present, they have learned some particular ways to think. I call them tools for thought. Ways to deal with information. For example, they can distinguish between an idea and the reality. They can make, they can distinguish different kinds of animals, different kinds of plants. They can also look at different sizes from very big, big elephants to very small, like mice, for example. And they have scales to judge that by. Now, at that time, 35,000, something special happens. 
suddenly more people meet each other. And so a larger group can start thinking about certain problems. And because it is a larger group, there are more ideas. And so people start changing the technology that they have. They make little stones and they put the little stones in pieces of wood to make a knife. They take a piece of bone and from that bone they make a hook to catch the fish. Those are all new ideas. Around 10,000 before present, they, charge, they change again. They start living in villages, building little houses, you making pots, using different technologies, and technologies that are more difficult to make than what they made before. So they do more information processing. That is what you see here. The other big change at that time is that people for the first time start changing the environment. So what we see now in the present is not new at all. People have been changing the environment for 10,000 years. In the beginning, a little bit. What they do is they take a piece of the forest, they put fire in it, they burn the trees, they take out the remains, and then they plant cereal, rice, or other cereals. And so, for the first time, they change the environment in order to do something that they want the environment to do. But it is humans who do it. It is not a change in the environment by itself. Okay? This is some of the things that they then start doing. As I show you, making pots. Using sticks in the ground to make place for the seeds. They also start making some sculptures. And they start making very large monuments with incredibly big stones, like this one in England. So, they work together to do that. You cannot do that with one family. You have to have several hundred people to actually start making a big monument like that. What is the most important part is that because they now change the environment, the environment changes back. And so humans think they can control the environment by changing it, but always something will happen that the environment does back. For example, if they have made a little field to put some seeds in, some animals may come that actually eat up all the seeds. So there is an interaction between people and the environment. They start building big buildings and they build them from mud. They dig up the mud in the ground and they dry it in the sun and then they make it into buildings. And that is what you see here. So that is the beginning of towns, of cities. And the interesting aspect of cities is that suddenly there are many more people together. And that makes some problems. On the one hand, they have to get food, and because there are more people, they have to get food from farther away. And at the same time, because there are more people, there are more people that are fighting among each other, that make social problems. And so they have to come up with ideas to make sure that people don't kill each other. And that's what you see here. Suddenly, you get people who are writing. First, they count. 
And in the middle of that image, at the top, you see a clay tablet which was used to write, but in a very special way. You know, they were trading. For example, they had 12 sheep, and the sheep had to go from one place to another place. So the shepherd had to take them. But because the, the person in one place was selling the sheep and the other was buying the sheep, they had to make sure that the shepherd didn't steal some. So they made clay tablets in which they put signs that showed how many sheep there were. So little by little, they actually managed to develop, and that is the lower left-hand side, a way to write by making little ticks in clay. Then what they also needed is an administration. The man in the bottom is a clerk in Egypt who actually makes contracts and things like that. And then the other big problem was that they had to make rules for people. And those rules are on the right-hand side. This is the first law book that exists in humanity. It was about 2,000 years before Christ in the Near East. And it is a stone column so that nobody can change things. And all the ways people have to behave are on there. So what I am showing you is how people organize themselves but also how they organize their environment. Now, once those cities grow bigger, they need food from farther. So, after a while, they create a very large empire because they make sure that people from very far send them food and the things they need. So what you get is that Empires emerge, and they do that so that there will not be fights between the tribes, between the populations, and so on. The example I have here is the example from the Roman Empire. And you can see on the map on the top left how that grew from yellow to dark green. And you can see on the right, in red, that the way to do this was to build roads. So they built roads all over Europe. And the roads they served for people to pass messages, written messages, from one place to the next, to also bring the food to Rome, and last of all, of course, to have armies. So what I'm trying to argue here is how over that whole period from 10, 12,000 before present to 600 or 1400 before present, which is 600 after the birth of Christ, humans make life much more complicated for themselves and for the environment. And now we're going to jump to a much later period, only two and a half centuries ago. And what you see in this graph is how people uh, in the right-hand side of the graph lived by using very little energy, only about 100 kilowatt hours. Now, on the, right, the left-hand side, you see how it is now. And the difference is that when you need only 100 kilowatt hours for a person, now every individual in America uses 11,000 kilowatt hours. Now that's not for food. That is to have the energy to build the buildings, to make the underground, to have the ships, to have all the infrastructure that we build. But of course the problem is then, where do we get the energy? And that is the time that we begin to use coal and later oil as the energy that makes this. So one of the big problems is that we are now, we have 
made, made our own habits and our own structure and our own environment in such a way dependent on energy, but also on iron and on all kinds of other materials, that in our minds, we cannot live without them. And that is, in essence, what this whole climate change problem is all about. Because we have devised a way of living that ruins the environment. And the question is, how much longer can we actually do that? And I go back to this little graph that I showed you before, which basically means that we are now in a situation where we know that if we keep going like this, the world is making things impossible because we don't have the energy that we need. And this shows that in a different way. Each of those red blobs is a domain, an area, where we are now already getting over what the Earth can actually permit us. And some of those are CO2, others are the loss of biodiversity, that is the loss of many species of plants and animals. Others are, have to do with how these oceans are heating up and becoming more acid, which kills all the, um, what do you call these things? Um, sorry kills a lot of organisms in the ocean, things like that. Now we get to the present, the last 50 years. The life has become so complicated with so many people, so many resources, so much infrastructure, that we don't have the means anymore to have the information about it that we need to live in it. And so what we get is information technology. And information technology makes a very fundamental change to our lives. And I want to get, talk a few minutes about that. It took humans about two million years to learn how to make good tools. It took humans about 10,000 years to learn how to exploit the environment as we now do. It took humans about 250 years to exploit energy the way we do now. Each of those revolutions completely changed life from people that were running around the forest to people sitting in villages, people from sitting in villages beginning to exploit the environment, which before that they had never done. And then nowadays, the fact that we have this huge oil industry that feeds our, our society, basically. This information technology change is going to be so big a change for all of us as all the other ones. And we have no idea how it will go because it is only beginning. That is, I think, the real issue. We don't have only the climate problem, but we also have the information problem. And the two are working together to make life difficult for us. How do they do that? Well, some of those things you already see. For one, if you have your cell phone, you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world. So the whole idea of space that separates people is no longer necessary. The same goes for time. That's more complicated, so I will not go into that in detail, but it happens. The other thing that happens is because of the web. Before, you had newspapers. And newspapers told you some of the things that the government and governing classes wanted you to know. Now, everybody talks to everybody. And so many people have very different opinions. I will forever remember when Donald Trump in America was made president, the first thing that he did, he disagreed about something, 
And so he said that what we always thought was wrong. And his press secretary began to talk about alternative truths. That is, a truth for other people. So we now have big confusions about what is true and what is not true. We also are beginning to see that what was the normal way for nations to interact, like from the 17th century till the middle of the last century, there was sort of an unspoken, unwritten agreement that countries only cared about their own inside populations. Now, what we see is that countries like Russia, China, but also others, are interfering in the elections of other countries. Another thing that we see is that the democratic system that we had is collapsing. Why is it collapsing? Because the politicians don't need any longer the help of the population or the help of the political parties to actually find out what the population wants. They now pay a huge amount of money to an American company that knows about 5,000 things about every American. So the whole political party is useless. The same way we see that our communities, and this is not so much in Japan as it is in other countries, but that our communities are suffering. More and more, we communicate with Facebook, and we communicate less intensively with our neighbors. Because we don't communicate so much with our neighbors, we don't have many shared and discussions and shared opinions. But the other problem is that if we are in trouble, our neighbors, who we don't know, can't help us. And these people on the other side of the world that you have been talking to, they're too far away to help. So our communities are beginning to disappear. And all those things are things, I think, and that was the purpose of my talk here, are things that are so fundamentally changing our society that we should not only think about climate change, but also start thinking about how the information revolution is actually beginning to make changes for our societies. So for me, the big danger is two. On the one hand, climate change and environmental change. On the other hand, information change. It doesn't mean that everything is bad. Some of the things information technology does well are really, really important. But I think what is a big problem is that we live in a political system that doesn't control anymore where we go. It doesn't really plan for the future very much. It solves problems that are problems in the present, but there is now no real direction of where the world could go. And I think that is a very, very big problem. Now, politicians, when you ask them, say, well, we shall innovate our way out of trouble. And I answer them, 250 years of innovation have got us into trouble. So we may have to change the way we think about that. We may want to get control over what all these companies are doing to make money. We need to be quite serious in stopping the current development where now five or six or maybe 10 companies effectively control all the information of everybody. And I'm not so worried about privacy and things like that. I am simply worried that those companies have such an important grip on our society that we need to put things in place that actually limits that. So that's sort of the main thing that I wanted to bring across. And I will 
end with a few things that I think are really positive that are happening. And some of those are here in Japan. I am actually here to look at how some villages that have been very badly depopulated, people have left them, are now beginning to re-emerge and recreate a sense of community. This is also happening in England. And there it is happening in the towns. England had a very bad economic crisis and many city governments decided that the only way to do something would actually be to mobilize the citizens themselves to do it. So one of the big lessons that I take from this is that we have been, and my generation particularly, we have been very lazy. We have voted and then we left governing to the people we voted for. We should be much more active politically in our own communities. We should take responsibility for our own lives and the ways in which that life evolves. And I think that is the battle that we have to start, and we have started, but that we have to much wider go in order to both deal with climate change and deal with some of these information problems. Thank you.